You got quiet. You must be ready. You ready? Ready to be back? Ready to get going? Yeah. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for these precious ladies that have come out tonight because they want to know you better. They want you to work more in their lives, more effectively. Uh, and Lord, I know that puts a smile on your face. That blesses you. Thank you that you give us the power, that you love us so much that, that we can affect you. And so, Father, would you uh, pour your spirit on us tonight, Lord, and stir in us uh, all that you want to. Lord, we, we come with different needs. We come with uh, very different lives, and yet you are Jehovah. You're the one that is able to meet us. So soften our hearts, make us hungry for you to do that work that you want to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So we are starting, we will be studying two letters this year. Uh, we'll be spending most of our time because it's, there's more chapters in First Timothy. And we're just going to do an overview and a little bit of history of uh, just First Timothy today. Um, Letters were different when they were written at the time of Paul because in those letters, they would tell you who was writing the letter right away. And I don't know why we don't do that because you ever get a letter and you don't know who it's from or sometimes somebody will send me a copy of an email letter that someone has sent and first thing I do is scroll down to the bottom, who wrote it? Because I, I want to know, and you know, when you think about something like a letter that is talking about how we should walk as Christians, you know, I want to know right away, you know, who's telling me how I'm supposed to walk and what I'm supposed to do with the Word of God, you know? Is it somebody that, that knows or not? And so in, these, in those times, they write away, told who is writing the letter, and Paul said he was writing it. First Timothy uh, would be about eight typed pages I, I put in my, my notes, and I thought, you know, I, that would really be something, you know, reading eight typed pages and not knowing who it was from. So, so this really helps. But you might be asking a question. Uh, this is written to Timothy 2,000 years ago to this young guy who's a pastor. Why should I spend basically nine months, three weeks out of the month, nighttime, to study something that was written to a young pastor 2,000 years ago? What does that have to do with me? You know, and I, I thought this morning even when, when I, the alarm went off and I'm still kind of on Hawaii time, and I, I said to Gia, why do people go to Bible study? You know, it's just like... If I had a choice, would I go, you know? And you were here, and, I, and as I prayed, that, that blesses the heart of the Lord, and it certainly blesses me, too, that I know, and, and you've come from busy days. And uh, the temptation, as you well know, to just stay home is, is great, but you're here. And so why? Why study Timothy? Here's some questions for you. Do you want to know what conversations tend to distract you from your faith. Paul's going to talk about that. Conversations to, to avoid. Conversations that maybe we might think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. And yet Paul says, flee them. Stay away from them. What kind of conversations are those? Do you want to know the things inside and outside the church that might look good, but in reality are not? Do you want to understand faith better? Do you want to know the qualities you should look for in a church leader, whether it be a goal you have for yourself or those that, that you should expect of a leader? I mean, I've heard some leaders say, don't look at me, look at Jesus. True, in some sense, but, but Paul definitely taught that we are to have expectations of those who represent Christ, and really that's all Christians, right? We all should be representing Jesus. So, so what is God looking for? Paul talked about this great controversy of the mystery of godliness. The great controversy of the mystery of godliness. If I said to you, could you explain to me the great controversy of the mystery of godliness? 
And yet, you will be able to do that in a few weeks. How are we tr to treat older men, younger men, older women, younger women? Do we treat them all the same within the church? Or is there some different ways that we are to treat different ages and different sexes? Paul's going to tell us. What about those in financial need? What's the church's responsibility? What's the biblical church's responsibility to help those in need? What is the responsibility of the individual to help those in need? Paul will address that. What about women in general? Is it biblically okay for women to teach men? Or wine. Paul told Timothy, drink some wine. What's the biblical perspective on that? And then, in what lies contentment? Or how are we to view our riches? We live in the United States of America. We have a lot. How are we to view those things, the, the material things that we have? Get rid of it all? Don't have anything? Or what is our perspective supposed to be? See, in a, a lot of those things, probably all of those things, you have heard a lot of opinions about those. Haven't you? You know, this is the way it's supposed to be. But as Galatians 4.30 says, nevertheless, what does Scripture say? And out of all of those things that we're talking about, we will be able to come back and go, you know what? The Bible says this. And that's what's important, isn't it? What does the Bible say about these things? Our theme verse is 1 Timothy 1.5. Now, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. And as I talked about when I did the announcement a couple Sundays ago, you know, I want to be in this place. You know, the purpose of the commandment is not to get people to think, i got to try to be good, and I've got to try and put all these efforts into things and, and beat myself up when I fail. No, the purpose of the commandment is to work love inside of us and a love that we express towards one another. You want this? <laughs> you know, I want this. I want to love and live with a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. You know, right there, it's like, all right, I'll do the nine months of the Bible study. If, if God can do that in my life, I want it. So much of this letter helps us understand what a Christian life looks like. But these things are motivated by love. And so we see the result. Pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. I want to live experiencing those things. And all of them reveal this, this sense of well-being, doesn't it? A, a sense of not only doing right, but doing right for the right reasons. That's what, Lord willing, our, our study of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy after that will work into our lives. In all the instructions in these letters, though, we uh, could have that tendency to look at the thing as how we're supposed to walk and just throw up our hands. Oh, not me. I, I can't. You know, I've tried. I just keep messing up. You know, I, I can't do it. But see, God does the changes. And too often in Christianity, we think, all right, I accept Jesus as my Savior, and then I'm going to pull it together, and I'm going to be a good, wonderful person. All on my own strength. A couple weeks ago, I was reading uh, Psalm 23 in my devotions. And in uh, verses 2 and 3, it says about the Lord, He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, a lot of you know I'm a word study buff, and I saw leads twice there, and I, I originally just wanted to know what the definition was, but they're two different Hebrew words. And the first one that, that talks about that he leads me beside the still waters, it's a, it leads with care. It gives rest. It's a, it's a guiding to a watering place or a refreshing place. And, and one definition I, I loved was 
to journey by stations or stages. And I thought, isn't that what life is like? You know, God's taking us to that resting place, but there's kind of stages or stations that we go through to get there sometimes. And it's, you know, he'll say, stop here, and I'm going to work this into your life, you know. And then he pulls it, takes us a little bit further, and he works something else in our life. And then we get to that place of, ah. Oh. Sometimes he brings us straight there. And then the second one where he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. It means to transport or bestow. See, we, we're told in uh, Colossians 12 that he, he takes us from the kingdom of darkness and delivers us, transports us into the kingdom of his son. And that's kind of like an immediate thing, you know. Praise God, aren't you glad that he didn't, you know, pull you out of darkness and, and a little bit lead you into salvation and the kingdom of his son, you know. But, but see, the word is he transports us. He takes us from one place to another. And here, that's what this sense of here, he leads me in the path of righteousness. He just takes me over to them when we get saved. And then, then these paths of growing and going deeper with him and becoming more and more righteous, that's when... He's leading, and, and we follow. And so it's a sense of maybe we go into First Timothy with, God's going to take me there. God's going to do the changing. I need to just follow him and allow him to do that work. Jesus changes people, and he changes us faster when we follow and obey. Um, just recently, I was in Psalm 47 in my devotions, and it begins with, oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. And then it goes on about the blessing of praising the Lord. Well, when I read that, the morning I read that, my shoulder had hurt. I hadn't slept well. And, you know, it was just a, a bad morning. You know, and I looked at that and I was like, clap my hands, Lord. I, I can't. I, I'm not there. And I finished the psalm, and I did some reflecting, and at the end, I felt like the Lord said again, what about now? And I thought, okay, I'm a little closer, but I still don't feel like clapping my hounds and shouting to God with a voice of triumph, you know? And, and, but I felt like, okay, do I believe this or not? You know, God says, clap your hands, shout to him with a voice of triumph, and he'll do something inside me. So... There's an old Calvary song that actually says, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands, all you people, shout unto God with a voice of praise. And then it says, Hosanna, Hosanna, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And I can't do it with this arm, but praise him, praise him. Shout unto God with a voice of praise. So I did it. And you know what? He transformed me from that. I don't even want to do this day to, what do you have for me? You know, why? Because I believed what he said in his word. You know, the result of shouting to God with a voice of triumph is going to be a sense of joy. And so in First Timothy, as we see these ways to walk and we feel like, I can't. Yes, we can, because the spirit of God enables us to do all that he calls us to do. And this is exciting. But there's going to be lots of times in life, and you, you know it, and it says, I don't feel like it. I, I can't. And by faith, and we'll talk more about faith, a lot about faith this year, but by faith, okay, Lord, you say, if I do this, I'll be better. I don't believe you. But I do believe you. So I'm going to do it. And the result is joy. And when I got right here in my message, um, I, I took a break and, uh, then I came back, and, and I thought, I gave you a lot of reasons to study this letter. But after I came back from the break, I asked myself, or maybe the Lord asked me, where's your heart? And I think my heart is this. As I shared a couple Sundays ago, the most repeated word in First Timothy is faith. And I also shared that when I'm counseling, that if someone shares Whatever, I try to watch for whatever word they use a lot or whatever they talk about the most. And I go, okay, that's where they're at. That's what's important to them. And in this letter that we think is, when we just look at it, just a lot of instructions to a pastor, it's about faith. 
And that makes it pretty exciting. Paul kept talking about faith. So I did my little word search and printed out every scripture that he mentioned faith in 1 Timothy. You know, when someone recognizes or counts something about you, you kind of want to live up to what they see about you. If they say something nice, you know, I, I see that in you. It's like, I, I want to show them that I can be that. And Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1.12, he says, he was thanking Jesus because he called Paul faithful. That's a motivator. I mean, consider Paul's background, and this really encouraged me. I mean, this guy killed Christians. He was seething, looking all over wherever he could find a Christian. He wanted to take a Christian down. That's a bad guy, you know? And he wrote this, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Jesus put Paul into the ministry before he had proved himself faithful. Does that encourage you? You know, you, you look at, I want to serve God, and you oh, I know who I am. I'm just a failure. I've done all these horrible things. And then Paul wrote, I thank Jesus because he enabled me to do what he called me to do. And he counted me faithful. He saw me as faithful when anyone else that would have looked at me and said, it's scum. Who would want to be like Paul? Paul could never serve Jesus. And Jesus counts him faithful, and Paul says, I thank Jesus for that. And we can be that same way. You know, we think, let's start today if we haven't been faithful. And it's just like, you know what? From here on out, Lord, I want you to call me faithful. See me as faithful. Because he sees us in our, our, our choices of today and the future, not those past ones. Paul says, I thank Christ Jesus Jesus put Paul in the ministry because he knew what he would be like and Jesus knew he would enable him to be the way he needed to be. Do you want to soak in that truth more? Just, <laughs> wow, you know, that God can call us faithful, that count us faithful. Keep coming to the study. 1 Timothy 3.9 says, holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience. What does that mean? Do you want to know that? What's holding the mystery of faith with a pure conscience? Should be our goal. How can it be our goal? We don't even know what it is. Keep coming. 1 Timothy 3.11 speaks of wives. Keep popping. I thought it was, I could take it off. Um, it speaks of wives being faithful in all things. What's God looking for? Uh, in a wife or in any of us to be described as faithful in all things? Certainly not perfection. So what kind of Christian living could be described as that? Faithful in all things. Keep coming. First Peter 4.11 says that in the latter times, which we are in, some shall depart from the faith. What, not will, but what does that look like when someone departs from the faith? Do you think you'll be able to identify it when you see it or hear it? Keep coming. And then in chapter 4, Paul wrote, this is a faithful saying and, and quotes some statements. It's just like, you know, we can count on everything in the Bible, but he's pointing out some specific things. You can count on this. Want to know what they are? Do you want to have trust in them? Keep coming. In chapter 6, Paul wrote about how we're to view money. How can we have it and not love it? How can we have it and not cling to it? How can our viewpoint of money cause us to err from the faith? Because he says it can. See, do you want to have the right perspective of the money that you have? Keep coming. And then in verse 11 of chapter 4, Paul tells us to flee some things or chapter six, and follow after others. And one of those things we're to follow is faith. How do we not only have faith and be faithful,
but follow after faith. Keep coming. And then in verse 12, Paul wrote that we are to fight the good fight of faith. When was the last time you finished the day and said, I fought the good fight of faith? But we should be able to say that. We're supposed to be able to say that. What does it mean to fight the good fight of faith? How do we do it? See, every day you and I have opportunities to fight the good fight of faith. And sometimes it's at home, sometimes it's in the workplace. But whatever our lives are, he gives us opportunities to fight the good fight of faith. Keep coming. So I like the, the first reasons I gave you about this book, but, but I realize as I look back at them, they're, they're all pretty heady. You know, they're, they're things that I, do you want to know a lot? You know, do I want to know what the Bible says do I, about women teaching or drinking or uh, taking care of those in financial need? It's, it's head stuff. It's we should know. But see, the second stuff I said, that's the stuff that appeals to the soul. You know, that, that's the stuff that I want to be different than I was. So, First Timothy, yes, we're going to learn a lot of just biblical concepts. But more than that, our faith is going to be touched. Our souls are going to be touched. And I'm excited about that because those are the things that, that draw me and, and stir me. We are going to take a nine-minute break from the message and watch a video, which is an overview of 1 Timothy. I like it. It's pretty straightforward. It does have a, play, a couple places where they, they throw in some personal interpretation, um, maybe about women teaching or about slaves. If you can, just kind of block that out and get the concept of the book because we, we don't want to enter this book with, with someone's opinion of some of these things. We want to find out what God has to say. But I think you'll kind of enjoy it and you'll get a, a better feel of the book. So, nine minutes. Paul's first letter to Timothy. Paul spent many years traveling about and starting new churches, and he developed a large team of co-workers in this mission. Timothy was one of these. Paul was once in the city of Lystra, and he met Timothy's faithful mother and grandmother, and he was impressed by Timothy's passion and devotion to Jesus. And so Paul mentored him for many years and eventually started sending him on missions to different churches. And so when Paul got word about a group of leaders who infiltrated the influential church in Ephesus, they were spreading incorrect views about Jesus and what it means to follow him, he sent Timothy to confront these leaders and restore order to this church. So after Timothy arrived there, Paul sent this letter to follow up and instruct him on how to fulfill this mission. The letter has a really cool design. There's an opening and closing commission to Timothy to go confront these leaders and their bad theology. And then these surround two large central sections that are full of really practical instructions about the problems that Timothy faced in the Ephesian church. And then finally, all these sections are linked together or concluded by a series of three poems that each... He's talking about there's three sections in 1 Timothy where he kind of just breaks out in an acknowledgement of who Jesus is and praises him. So that's what he's talking about. And hopefully we can get this back. Okay. The world. Let's dive in and you'll see how it works. Paul opens by recalling how he sent Timothy to Ephesus to confront these leaders who were spreading their strange teaching. And he describes how these guys are obsessed with speculating about the Torah, specifically the early stories and genealogies in the book of Genesis. And as we'll see, they had developed all kinds of weird teachings about food and marriage and sex that weren't consistent with the teachings of Jesus or the apostles. He even names some of these people, Alexander and Hymenaeus, and he describes how their teaching has divided the church, it's generated controversy. And Paul says this is actually the first clear sign that their teaching is distorted. When genuine Christian teaching is done, it's faithful to the way of Jesus and it results in love and genuine faith. 
And he says the purpose of the Torah anyway isn't to fuel speculation. Rather, its purpose is to expose the truth about the human condition, as it did for Paul. Correct teaching about the Torah will lead people to see the grace of God revealed in the Messiah who came to save sinful, broken people. And so Paul closes here with a poem that honors King Jesus over all, and he calls Timothy to shut these men and their false teaching down. He then addresses very specific problems in this church caused by the false teachers. First of all, he calls Timothy to hold regular church prayer gatherings, to pray for the governing leaders of Rome, and for peace. Because peace in the land, it creates an ideal setting for Jesus' followers to keep spreading their message about the God of peace, who wants all people to be saved, the God who sent Jesus as the only mediator to give his life as a ransom for all. In contrast to the false teachers, Paul reminds Timothy that God wants to rescue the whole world, and prayer is going to keep this at the forefront of their minds. Paul then addresses problems related to men and women who are being influenced by these corrupt leaders in Ephesus. So he first shuts down a group of men who were getting drawn into angry theological disputes started by the teachers. He says these guys should learn how to pray. Then he confronts a group of wealthy women in the church who were treating the Sunday gathering like a fashion show. They were dressing so upscale that they would shame most of the other people who couldn't afford such a wardrobe. And not only that, but some of these women were also usurping leadership positions in the church and they were teaching others the bad theology of the corrupt teachers. And so Paul shuts these women down. He says they should not teach or lead in the church. And then he goes on to explore the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent from Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is one of those sections in Paul's letters where, like Peter said, he's kind of hard to understand. There are many different views about what Paul meant here. Some think that Paul is prohibiting women from ever teaching or leading men in any church, and that his comments about Adam and Eve are about how God has ordered that only men should be leaders in the church. There are others who think that Paul is prohibiting women from having leadership authority over men in a church, but that once educated women should and can teach as leaders in a church under male leadership. And there are still others who think that Paul is only prohibiting these women in Ephesus and that his comments about Adam and Eve are a comparison of how these women have been deceived by the false teachers. Whichever view you take, Paul is clear that these Ephesian women need to come under Timothy's leadership and get a proper theological education. And the goal is to help them grow so that they could one day become like the outstanding female ministers that Paul mentions in his other letters, like Phoebe or Junia or Priscilla. Paul continues to address this leadership crisis, and he calls Timothy to appoint a small, healthy team of husbands and fathers who will act like elders or overseers for the church. These should be men of outstanding character and integrity, and they will work alongside a team of deacons. It's a Greek word that means servant. And these are men and women who actually lead and do the ministries of the church, and they are to have the same kind of character as the elders. And all together, these people should be known for healthy relationships in their families, because that will demonstrate their ability to lead in the church, which is God's family. And the way of life that they live all together, it's consistent with the story about Jesus, which is explored in the closing poem, about his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation as king, and then the spread of his new family throughout the whole world. Paul's second body of instructions for Timothy are, again, very specific to the problems caused by these bad leaders. So he first corrects their bad theology. They've been telling people to stop eating certain kinds of foods, most likely meat, and to stop getting married, which Paul thinks is ridiculous. So he goes to Genesis 1, and he reminds Timothy that God's entire creation is very good, including food and marriage. It is all to be received with gratefulness by those who know and give thanks to the Creator. Paul then moves on to address problems about the church's care of widows. So this very important ministry was being taken advantage of by younger, wealthy widows, most likely the same troublemaking women from chapter 2. They would sign up for the church's support, but then spend their days sleeping around, spreading gossip, and damaging the church's reputation in the city. Paul is having none of it. He says that only older widows that have no other family support qualify, and for these, the church should show the love and generosity of Jesus. 
Paul then addresses problems among some older men in the church. And Timothy is to respect their age, but not their misbehavior, which seems to be alcohol-related. They're damaging the church's reputation in Ephesus. And so Timothy is in love to confront them and have them step down if they're in leadership. And then Paul adds this interesting side note that this doesn't mean that Timothy himself should never drink. Given his stomach problems, he should probably have a glass of wine each night with dinner. Paul then addresses a problem among Christian slaves. Some of them were disrespecting their Christian masters. And so, yes, the gospel creates equality among Jesus' followers. However, Paul thinks that equality needs to be implemented in a strategic way that doesn't compromise the mission and witness of the church. If Christians become associated with slave rebellions, they are compromised. The Christian transformation of the Roman household had to be implemented strategically so that their neighbors could be persuaded and not repulsed by this new vision of God's family. Finally, Paul closes the letter by calling Timothy again to confront the corrupt leaders. Paul here exposes their motives to make lots of money by accumulating followers and then charging them all high rates for their teaching. These teachers betray Jesus and his message of contentment and simple living. And so Paul instructs the wealthy Ephesian Christians to become rich in good works and generosity, to be people who submit all of their resources to King Jesus, and he's the one who inspires the final poem about how he is the true king above all other kings. 1 Timothy is a really important letter. It helps us gain a holistic vision of the nature and mission of the church. So what a Jesus community believes will directly shape how that community lives and behaves in its city. And so its theology, its beliefs have to be constantly critiqued and formed by the scriptures and the good news about Jesus. And how the church is perceived in public is also very important to Paul. Christians should be known as people who are full of integrity, known for good works, known for serving the poor and the most vulnerable, all out of devotion to the risen King Jesus. And that's what 1 Timothy is about. He's talking about there's three sections in 1 Timothy where he kind of just breaks out in an acknowledgement of who Jesus is and praises him. So that's what he's talking about. And hopefully we can get this back. Okay. Let's dive in. You'll see how it works. Paul opens by recalling how he sent Timothy to Ephesus to confront these leaders who were spreading their strange teaching. And he describes how these guys are obsessed with speculating about the Torah, specifically the early stories and genealogies in the book of Genesis. And as we'll see, they had developed all kinds of weird teachings about food and marriage and sex that weren't consistent with the teachings of Jesus or the apostles. He even names some of these people, Alexander and Hymenaeus, and he describes how their teaching has divided the church, it's generated controversy. And Paul says this is actually the first clear sign that their teaching is distorted. When genuine Christian teaching is done, it's faithful to the way of Jesus and it results in love and genuine faith. And he says the purpose of the Torah anyway isn't to fuel speculation. Rather, its purpose is to expose the truth about the human condition, as it did for Paul. Correct teaching about the Torah will lead people to see the grace of God revealed in the Messiah who came to save sinful, broken people. And so Paul closes here with a poem that honors King Jesus over all, and he calls Timothy to shut these men and their false teaching down. He then addresses very specific problems in this church caused by the false teachers. First of all, he calls Timothy to hold regular church prayer gatherings, to pray for the governing leaders of Rome and for peace, because peace in the land, it creates an ideal setting for Jesus' followers to keep spreading their message about the God of peace, who wants all people to be saved, the God who sent Jesus as the only mediator to give his life as a ransom for all. In contrast to the false teachers, Paul reminds Timothy that God wants to rescue the whole world, and prayer is going to keep this at the forefront of their minds. Paul then addresses problems related to men and women who are being influenced by these corrupt leaders in Ephesus. So he first shuts down a group of men who are getting drawn into angry theological disputes started by the teachers. He says these guys should learn how to pray. Then he confronts a group of wealthy women in the church who were treating the Sunday gathering like a fashion show. They were dressing so upscale that they would shame most of the other people who couldn't afford such a wardrobe. 
And not only that, but some of these women were also usurping leadership positions in the church, and they were teaching others the bad theology of the corrupt teachers. And so Paul shuts these women down. He says they should not teach or lead in the church. And then he goes on to explore the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent from Genesis chapter 3. Now, this is one of those sections in Paul's letters where, like Peter said, he's kind of hard to understand. There are many different views about what Paul meant here. Some think that Paul is prohibiting women from ever teaching or leading men in any church, and that his comments about Adam and Eve are about how God has ordered that only men should be leaders in the church. There are others who think that Paul is prohibiting women from having leadership authority over men in a church, but that once educated, women should and can teach as leaders in a church under male leadership. And there are still others who think that Paul is only prohibiting these women in Ephesus and that his comments about Adam and Eve are a comparison of how these women have been deceived by the false teachers. Whichever view you take, Paul is clear that these Ephesian women need to come under Timothy's leadership and get a proper theological education. And the goal is to help them grow so that they could one day become like the outstanding female ministers that Paul mentions in his other letters, like Phoebe or Junia or Priscilla. Paul continues to address this leadership crisis, and he calls Timothy to appoint a small, healthy team of husbands and fathers who will act like elders or overseers for the church. These should be men of outstanding character and integrity, and they will work alongside a team of deacons. It's a Greek word that means servant. And these are men and women who actually lead and do the ministries of the church, and they are to have the same kind of character as the elders. And all together, these people should be known for healthy relationships in their families, because that will demonstrate their ability to lead in the church, which is God's family. And the way of life that they live all together, it's consistent with the story about Jesus, which is explored in the closing poem, about his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his exaltation as king, and then the spread of his new family throughout the whole world. Paul's second body of instructions for Timothy are, again, very specific to the problems caused by these bad leaders. So he first corrects their bad theology. They've been telling people to stop eating certain kinds of foods, most likely meat, and to stop getting married, which Paul thinks is ridiculous. So he goes to Genesis 1, and he reminds Timothy that God's entire creation is very good, including food and marriage. It is all to be received with gratefulness by those who know and give thanks to the Creator. Paul then moves on to address problems about the church's care of widows. So this very important ministry was being taken advantage of by younger, wealthy widows, most likely the same troublemaking women from chapter 2. They would sign up for the church's support, but then spend their days sleeping around, spreading gossip, and damaging the church's reputation in the city. Paul is having none of it. He says that only older widows that have no other family support qualify, and for these, the church should show the love and generosity of Jesus. Paul then addresses problems among some older men in the church, and Timothy is to respect their age, but not their misbehavior, which seems to be alcohol-related. They're damaging the church's reputation in Ephesus. And so Timothy is in love to confront them and have them step down if they're in leadership. And then Paul adds this interesting side note that this doesn't mean that Timothy himself should never drink. Given his stomach problems, he should probably have a glass of wine each night with dinner. Paul then addresses a problem among Christian slaves. Some of them were disrespecting their Christian masters. And so, yes, the gospel creates equality among Jesus' followers. However, Paul thinks that equality needs to be implemented in a strategic way that doesn't compromise the mission and witness of the church. If Christians become associated with slave rebellions, they are compromised. The Christian transformation of the Roman household had to be implemented strategically so that their neighbors could be persuaded and not repulsed by this new vision of God's family. Finally, Paul closes the letter by calling Timothy again to confront the corrupt leaders. Paul here exposes their motives to make lots of money by accumulating followers and then charging them all high rates for their teaching. These teachers betray Jesus and his message of contentment and simple living. And so Paul instructs the wealthy Ephesian Christians to become rich in good works and generosity, to be people who submit all of their resources to King Jesus, and he's the one who inspires the final poem about how he is the true king above all other kings. 
First Timothy is a really important letter. It helps us gain a holistic vision of the nature and mission of the church. So what a Jesus community believes will directly shape how that community lives and behaves in its city. And so its theology, its beliefs have to be constantly critiqued and formed by the scriptures and the good news about Jesus. And how the church is perceived in public is also very important to Paul. Christians should be known as people who are full of integrity, known for good works, known for serving the poor and the most vulnerable, all out of devotion to the risen King Jesus. And that's what 1 Timothy is about. And, uh, and I thought this morning as I was watching it, you know, it is like, did you, did you notice the reason why, one of the reasons why Paul wrote about women teaching is because they were teaching bad theology. As you study First Timothy, it doesn't say anything about that. The reason why uh, we don't approach uh, Christians didn't fight slavery at the time, what did he say? Uh, because it would rock the boat, you know. It's not there. Uh, but what I, I think I'm excited about is, now that you've seen it, I want to show it to you at the end of First Timothy, and I think you'll be able to go, wow, didn't say that. I didn't say that. The good purpose of, of this video was to give you an overview of the, the topics that will be covered, but uh, I, I think some of the conclusions based on the topics were is interesting. I want to just take a little bit of time and look at the history behind this letter. Paul was put under house arrest in about A.D. 59. He was under this house arrest when he wrote the letter of Philippians, uh, as we studied that last year, and then Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon during house arrest, not prison, but chained to a guard every hour of every day. And we find him at that place during his first Roman imprisonment at the very end of Acts. That's the last that we biblically know of Paul, and we read these words about him. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house, and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So he, he believed he was in that house arrest situation in Rome for about two years. Now we have some recorded history about Paul's life after that, not in the Bible, but done by Christian historians. After his house confinement, Paul went to what they called the uh, Western Limits, uh, the limits of the West, which is believed to have included Spain. We get this from a historian named Clement, who was the first writer that we have right after the New Testament. Paul wrote in Romans 15, 24, he planned to visit Spain. So it's believed that it's during that period, during that period of his missionary trials that he wrote that this, this first letter to Timothy. We call it the fourth missionary journey. I'll just show you for a minute the, the map of his different journeys. I learned how to expand it a little bit this morning. Uh, so you see the, the purple is his first missionary journey, and it was a, a little bit short. You know, he visited some churches, and then he went back to Antioch from where he was sent. And you see the yellow there that is highlighted, that's Lystra. And it's believed that during the first missionary journey, he met Timothy and led Timothy to the Lord. And then it was his second missionary journey, which I believe is the dark green, uh, and that they visited some of the churches that they had founded in the first one, picked up Timothy. Timothy was doing really well, had a good reputation among the people as far as his walk with the Lord. And so Timothy began traveling with Paul on a second missionary journey. And then the blue is the third missionary journey where Timothy was with him most of the time. Wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. Yes, and then the, the spring green color is where Paul went when he went back to Rome um, in his fourth missionary journey. And then we see Ephesus, where Timothy was. He was born in Lystra. He was ministering at this time in Ephesus, and that's where our book takes place. I was uh, 
you know, I like to look up different pictures, and I thought, what was it like when Paul first arrived in Rome? And uh, this is the Appian Way. This is the, the walk that they would take as they landed in the seashore and then walked into the city of Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, about Paul and those with him, they came to meet us as far as Appi Forum and Three Inns, which is about 43, 47 miles, so, you know, day to day walk. And I love this. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. You know, he had been on this this missionary journey. This is the one where he had the shipwreck. He ended up on Malta, the island of Malta, for a while and ministered there. And then he finally gets to Rome. And he's walking towards the city. And, and I'm sure he had all these expectations of what God was going to do. And the Christians met him. And, and it, it just so blessed him. This is another picture of that walkway. So you're walking past all these incredible, this is ruins now, but these incredible Roman buildings and, and columns and just, wow, you know, you ever been in some place that you've never been to on vacation and you heard about it and then you look and it's like, wow, this is just incredible. And this is what Paul got to see, but he ended up here. This is the uh, maritime prison in Rome where it is believed that Peter and Paul spent their last days. And here's another picture. Which can you imagine, you know, coming into the city just expecting, you know, all these great things and, and ending up here. And it was there that he wrote the second letter of Timothy. And it was the last letter that he wrote. And he said this when he was in prison. He knew he was about to die. And it said, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept, what? The faith. Faith was so important to him. So he knows he's about to go out. And, and I want to go out like that. I don't want to go out like, oh, there's so much I haven't done yet, you know? I should have done, and that kind of thing. He goes, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. That's where we want to be. There's a real sense of, of Paul just kind of handing the baton off to Timothy here in 2 Timothy. So what's the connection between Paul and Timothy? Timothy pops up about 24 times in the New Testament, I think probably more than any other companion of Paul's. He's first introduced in Acts 16 during Paul's second missionary journey. Found him in Lystra, which is modern Turkey. I showed you that. And he found him to be the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. And then his father was Greek, who was not a believer. And the people of the town spoke well. Timothy. So Paul had Timothy join him. And yesterday when I was studying, I, I went through and I typed every city that, that Timothy went to with Paul and all the cities where Paul had him stay somewhere else and Paul went on without him, you know, and I, I had this long little list for you and, and then I, I stared at it and realized I barely care and I know you don't either. So just know that during those missionary journeys, Timothy was with Paul a lot. He ministered with Paul. They got to see God work together. So Paul called Timothy names like, he's my fellow worker. He's my beloved and faithful son in the Lord. He's our brother. He's a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He's a minister of God. He's a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ. That's Timothy. That's what he called him. And then as he, he talked about things of, of his character and what he would be what he was like as he would tell the churches, I'm sending Timothy to you and this is what you can expect. And and I loved reading these and, and I thought you know, there's so many times before I do a retreat, someone will say, well, 
what can you tell me about Kathy Dickinson? And I, I looked at this list and I thought, oh, Lord, may people be able to say these things about me. So he will teach you of my ways. Paul said, he'll teach you just like I, I've been teaching. He's solid. He does the work of the Lord. He will establish you and encourage you in your faith. He's like-minded with me. He seeks the things of Christ. And he had proven characters. Character. Is there anything there that, that you can't do or I can't do? Nothing. You know? and, and, and may that be what, what people would say about you and about me. Hebrews 13, 23 reveals that Timothy had spent time in prison himself as well as he stayed with Paul in prison. They'd been through a lot together. And so there was this, this bond between them. And I encourage you, that's, that's one of the sweetest things about ministering with someone else is, is there's this bond. I do probably 85% of the retreats that I do with, with Gia. And, and what we get to do is, is see God work. You know, we can, before a retreat starts sometimes, it's just, you know, we don't feel good or we're tired, you know, and it's just, I don't think I've ever started a retreat saying I, I'm so glad I'm here. Every time in all these years that I've done a retreat, it's, I don't know why I'm doing this, you know. And, and then we get to do what we get to do and we get to, then we, we're done and it's like, did you see what God did? Did you see what that lady said? You know, and there's this connection, and Paul and Timothy had that, and, and we can have that as we, we minister with one another. And it, it's so neat how we affect one another. I don't know why this flashed through my mind, but um, what do I typically say in, when we start? I'll say, will you pray with me, right? What, what does Amy say when she's up here doing announcements? She goes, she, she actually does this sometimes. She'll go, will you pray with me? I go, that's my girl, you know. Uh, there's, there, we've affected one another, and, and that's what you want to have in ministry is, is influencing it, each other, hopefully, in a, in a good way. So Paul and Timothy had this, and he seemed so proud of Timothy and felt safe in sending Timothy to represent Jesus and to represent Paul. And the letters sent to Timothy are letters teaching Timothy what is important to be passed on to the people. And see, we're the people. We're the generations that have come many, many years down the line with the same tendency to fall prey to error and to fall prey to wrong living, with the same need to be reminded of not only right living, but the incentive that right living produces and hearts that want it. The video said it is well, or the video said it well, when it spoke of Paul's concern for what the, the church was doing, and we as believers, uh, what we're, we're known for. Paul, Paul felt the importance of that, that the world's watching us. And the challenge is, well, what do people say about you? What pe do people say about me? Oh. And Paul was so fervent. I was thinking about how one thing that, that Paul was fervent against was just saying things that tickled people's ears. And I was thinking about book titles and, and how, you know, there's some book titles out there that's just like, oh. I want to know what's in that book, you know, it's just, that's what I want. And when I was writing Taming the Giants, you know, people were saying, you know, no, you should title it, Kill the Giants, Defeat the Giants, because people want to kill depression. They want to defeat discouragement. And, and I thought, well, it might sell more books, but we can't. You know, wouldn't you like to kill depression? But depression will not be killed until we stand before Jesus and he changes us. Do you love to just wipe out fear where you never feared again? No, can't be done. But we can tame it. We can have it so it doesn't rule in our lives. 
But I, I thought about this book and I thought, you know, really this is how to live a life worth following and love doing it. And if I, I titled a book like that, you know, wouldn't you like, wow, I want to live a life worth following and I want to love living that life. And I think we can find that in First Timothy and, and that's exciting. So we have got some really sweet things to look forward to. Will you pray with me? <laughs> Father, <laughs> Lord, that that's a true statement that we can live a life worth living and we can love living that life. And God, you have put before us all we need to have life and godliness, everything we need. And so, Lord, um, stir in us an excitement about studying this book. Lord, you know our schedules. You know our lives. You know how easy it is for us to just stay home. Lord, um, may we, each and every one of us, ask you to give us that boot to do our homework, to come whether we've done it or not, and to encourage one another and learn of you. Thank you, praise you that you are not a distant God, but you're a God that draws so very close to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have Gia here, and those of you that have worshiped with Gia, you're smiling right now. Let's worship. You know, as, as I was sharing about, clap your hands, all you people, you know, we've come from busy days. We've got hard stuff going on sometimes, and yet he is worthy. And so let's put all of that aside and believe him when he says he meets us when we praise him.
seen prone to wander, I was thinking about um, the definitions that Kathy gave in Psalm 23. And it says, he leads me in the path of righteousness. And I like that whole idea of it, him transporting us there. But um, we can still wander from it if we want to. If he's going, okay, here's the path of righteousness. Um, but it's so true of us that we are so prone to wander and I think sometimes we are wandering and we don't even um, realize it sometimes because we think we're gonna we're doing good things um, and it's all well intended even um, especially in in ministry where you're like well I'm doing this for God you know and and yet even in ministry even in serving Him sometimes we um, end up building our own kingdoms rather than being a part of his. <laughs> we spend all this effort into um, making our lives and our families and our ministries Instagram worthy, but is it God worthy? Does it glorify him in the end? And anything that's not of him, you know, it's kind of like, you know, we, we put together these uh, it's almost like, you know, when if your kids come home with, like, popsicle stick, um, like, buildings and things and glued macaroni on it <laughs> and stuff. It's like going before God, but look what I did. And it's like, eh. <laughs> you know, you can just kind of go, and it would just kind of blow over. <laughs> I mean, what is it really worth before the glory of God, these kingdoms that we build for ourselves here and I know that in my life I want um, to be set on, on just loving him and pleasing him and before his kingdom, not for my kingdom. Not what my idea of what this Christian life is and what ministry is and what, you know, like I said, Instagram worthy life is, but what God worthy life is. So all these kingdoms that I've made in my life, I, I, you know, it's my prayer that he would just tear them down, you know. Because what are we supposed to do with those kingdoms that we make before the Lord? We're like, I mean, they're, they're nothing. But if our lives are for him, and if we're walking in those paths of righteousness and in the way he intended, how glorious that is, how lovely that is. That's a life that's worth following. Um, you might not know this song, but it's not a hard one. So please sing it along with me. I'll teach you the chorus first. How about that? The chorus is really easy. Just go like this. Take over the
This heart of stone to turn it into flesh. Spirit, soften it. I give you all I have. I'm holding nothing back. Jesus, I am yours. Jesus, I am. Thirsty. Turn it into flesh, spirit soften it. I give you all I have. I'm holding nothing back. Jesus, I am yours. Jesus, I am. Good game this world. 
Nothing compares to knowing you, Lord. You're our reward. Our kingdoms are nothing before you because you're the Lord. You are king. May everything in this life be to please you, to honor you, to glorify you, to know you more, Lord. And I pray for anybody in this room who's maybe fearful of allowing you <laughs> to take their kingdom away. Or may they know that your kingdom is so much greater. And that as the song said, you are the lover of our souls and all that you want for us is good. So we don't need to fear in going deeper with you. We don't need to fear in surrendering to you. So take us deeper, we pray. You call me out upon the water, the grave. Grapes abound in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my guide. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you never fail, and you won't stop. Keep 
You know, Gia was talking about rewards and kingdoms, and um, Paul will address these men that uh, he said that they think godliness is gain. And we, we look at these guys and we think, oh, what terrible people they are. But, you know, it's a challenge to you and to me. You know, why do we do what we do? <laughs> You know, why do, why do we say we want to follow God? Why do we go to church? Why do we read the word? Is there a part of us sometimes that just want to gain, you know, to benefit to? Maybe we think we can manipulate God. You know, if I spend time with him, he will do this. And, and, uh, and Psalm, it says he leads me in paths of righteousness for what purpose? For his name's sake. You know, and that, that's where... The joy is we, we, we were created to glorify him. We work best when we live lives that are all about his name's sake. So may that be us, ladies. And I, I think as we study First Timothy, he's going to work into us that desire to want to do what we do for his name's sake. Um, dismiss you to groups. Our count is 30. Oh, I can do that. That's divided by three is ten. Um, now, when we had our pre-Bible study leaders meeting uh, last week, um, I asked the assistants, what's the, the hardest thing about being an assistant? And they said, this night, right here, when I have to stand at the door, and when number 11 comes to the group, you know, they have to say, oh, I'm sorry, we're full. So I, I don't want to do that to the assistants. We, we want to be nice to them. And so, um, if you are number 11 and your friend is number 10, not a problem. If you are number 12 and you're just like, you know, I just really want to be in this group, that's fine too. You know, you don't even have to cry. You know, you just have to say, you know. So, the idea is just to keep our groups as balanced as we can. So, um, appreciate you respecting that. But if there's a group that you really want to be in, that's all you got to say is, you know, I just really want to be in this group, and you got it, okay? God bless you, ladies.